Иннопром. Ladies and gentlemen, Anton Atrushkin, the head of Innoprom Business Agenda and the moderator of the present session. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends, and welcome to Innoprom Exhibition. In the morning, I was thinking, how should I open this session? But life is always the best teacher. I overheard a conversation at the reception of two participants. Probably they're here. And they were discussing the agenda for today. And they thought, how do we make it? How, how, and this, how do we make it, is the question which is, um, which is always heard over the course of negotiations, always heard in the board meetings. How do we make it? How do we make sure that we are not late? How do we implement technologies and be the first? How do we keep ahead of the competition? And I do hope that our today's session will be very practical. We'll, we'll stay down to the earth. We'll talk about important topical issues, practical issues. And we want to make sure that you take away something useful and, again, practical from this session. I'm the moderator of this session, and I'll try to keep silent, because we have far too many stars on this stage. And I'm inviting the participants of this session. This is the key strategic session of Inaprom. So, Zunzi Tsuda, the president of International Federation of Robotics and the head of the board of Yaskava Corporation. Um, we, we have long-standing relationship with the International Federation of Robotics, and for the second time, the president of the federation is participating in, in the prom. Stefan Lamper, CEO of KUKA Robotics. KUKA is taking regular uh, is participating regularly in Innoprom, and we are delighted to see the head of the company here today. Stefan, please, you're welcome. Hans Fechner, CEO of Zimpelkamp. The company has been participating in Innoprom for a number of years, from 2012. And the, oh, the founder of the company, Dieter Zim, D D Dieter, the, oh, the founder of Zimpelkamp also participated in our key strategic session. The CTO of ABB, Basmi Hussein. Dear, dear Basmi, dear Mr. Hussein, please, you're welcome. And for the first time at Innoprom, we see the president and the, and the executive director of Vika company, Alexander Vigand. I, it's your first. It's the, it's the first time you're participating in Innoprom, and I do hope it will be a success to you and your company. And also, I'm inviting to this stage one of the key participants of our strategic session, a permanent member of our strategic session, Minister, Minister of Industry and Trade, Denis Mantorov. He will make a welcoming address to you on behalf of the head of the Russian government. To participants and guests of Innoprom 2018, dear friends, I'm delighted to welcome you in Yekaterinburg at this International Industrial Exhibition in the Prom 2018. As years go by, this forum is becoming more and more interesting and more and more powerful. And the quality of exhibition is becoming better. The exhibition is becoming more representative. Russian and foreign businesses are well represented there. and. The range, in terms of the range of issues which are discussed here, Innoprom can rival leading industrial exhibitions. Traditionally, different businessmen, experts, public officials, and head of governmental bodies are looking for answers for topical questions and challenges which relate to new technologies and the, the impact these technologies have upon our life. They are trying to see the shapes 
of the shape of the future. They are trying to understand how companies and industries and entire countries should live and work and develop themselves in the context of the fourth in industrial revolution. Our subject today is digital, digital production. How do we make sure that people, machines, and software can interact with each other in the most efficient way? How do we bring together different innovations, and how do we get an the positive effect from these innovations. And these are the questions which our economy also have to, has to answer. And Russia needs technological breakthrough today. And, and it, is, it was clearly outlined in the May decree of the Russian president. It's one of our national objectives. And depending on how efficient we are in reorganizing our economy, on depending on how can we employ the latest technologies and knowledge, how can we employ this for building the new industry, that will determine the level of our competitiveness, and that will determine the prosperity of our society and the level of safety we have. And we, I, I would say we're in a good shape. We have great mathematical school. We have great experience in the area of microelectronics and in, in the area of de software development, and most importantly, solutions for cybersecurity. Our policy in terms of in, in the area of input substitution has helped Russian IT companies to reach out for the foreign market. These companies are currently actively offering their technologies, and that cr that creates conditions for successful development of Industry 4.0 in our country. And I do believe that within the framework of Inoprom, you will discuss these topical issues, and you will come up to interesting ideas, conclusions, and projects. You will be able to find new business partners. And also, you will remember this major industrial exhibition in Russia, and it will become an important event in your professional life. We wish you success, fruitful work, and breakthrough initiatives. Dmitry Medvedev. Thank you so much. And dear colleagues, I think you have already paid your attention to the title of our session. And the first question to all, all, all of you, all participants and heads of companies uh, and from different, different uh, countries, so people, machines, and software, these three elements. Which, which significance is given to these elements within the framework of your strategy? So how do you blend them together? In what proportion? And in Inaprom, we have, let's say, 50% of people and 50% of robots. But here in this hall, we still have the dominating majority of humans. So people, as one of the, the combination, as one of the components, is it the weakest link or is it a factor which still has a lot of potential? Mr. Tsutsuda, what do you think? No, I think down the microphone, this one. No, once more. Yes. OK. Uh, the question was the human beings, hardware, and software. And a human being is the one who is weakest, actually, when they do the physical work. So we have we really tried to convert human being task from a physical work to brain task. So that's the direction all the world is going to. And in the hardware and software, they are core for the automation. So automating the process of manufacturing and moving shifting the people from uh, hard work, uh, labor work, physical labor work to brain work. That's a com that will be the combination of three. That's my answer. 
Thank you very much, dear Mr. Tsuda. And Mr. Basmi Hussein, your answer to the question regarding this triangle and the key components to success. Machines and software, uh, these were also the key elements of the uh, third industrial revolution. Um, so what is really the difference between the third industrial revolution and the fourth industrial revolution? I think the, it's very important to remember that the third industrial re revolution was about using, you know, hardware and software together with people to automate uh, the plants. Uh, the goal of the fourth industrial revolution is to move that towards more autonomous operations. Now, that's not going to be a digital event, but it'll be in varying degrees of autonomy. And what that means is that more and more things that earlier required human intervention, uh, the systems will be capable of handling things that were not explicitly uh, programmed or um, um, you know, foreseen. So the unforeseen circumstances, uh, the systems will be able to handle it. Now, in that situation, what happens then to people, what happens to machines, and what happens to software? All three have to change significantly. Machines have to become more intelligent. They have to be, become more aware of their own condition, aware of the environment around them, May, um, would be also easier to use. Software has to become, you know, uh, have a greater degree of uh, cyber physical interfaces, you know, newer kind of sensors, vision, these kind of things have to then be, software should be able to analyze that and take care of it. It should also then ca develop capabilities of newer techniques such as AI. But I think it's really the people that are the most important. So in the, in the triangle of uh, uh, machines, um, uh, software, and people, we believe it'll the people that are the most important and the most strongest of, of them all. Now, how people have to change is really new skills have to be imparted to them. Uh, new education has to be given. While there has been a great deal of effort that has gone into machines and software, not enough is being going into the needs of the people because they are the most crucial element in this, uh, uh, in this triangle. They, that's the element that has all the creativity, that has the um, element that, like in the previous revol uh, industrial revolutions, will be the deciding factor in uh, uh, essentially who gets the advantage. So my answer, I think the people are the most important element, they are the strongest element, but that strength has to be unleashed by a more focused approach towards the skill and the learning part of it. Thank you very much, dear Mr. Hussein. And I do hope that within the next year, there will be a substantial breakthrough in AI technologies, and we will be able to ask machines this question, whether human beings are still important for them, whether, whether this is still a meaningful factor in the revolution. And I would like me to ask Mr. Stefan Lampa, who is the head of the company, who is still managed by people, but who is producing robots. So CEO of Kuka Robotics. The impact, obviously, uh, from the human factor is the, is the most important. Um, uh, the, the, the migration from mechanical solutions towards software solutions have happened now over many years, more than 20 years, more and more functionality has been moved from hardware uh, mechanical solutions towards software solutions. That is a continuous migration that is happening. Uh, what the Industrial Revolution 4 is providing for is the connected uh, opportunity that all of a sudden can we connect the solutions, we can connect the robots, and with that, that migration can go even faster because now we can uh, start utilizing tools such as uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and that will help people in a tremendously more accelerated way than we've seen in the past. Uh, 
in order to benefit from this, obviously we need then to look at the most difficult part of the chain, which is once again back to ourselves. It's we as humans uh, that needs now to adopt to these solutions and, and, and learn uh, how to uh, bring the maximum power out of that. And, and that is always the, the slowest part in these, uh, these changes. Technology is there, technology is ready for it, but we are still in the phase of understanding what, what needs to be done uh, from a schooling, uh, training, education, uh, and, and also awareness. M many times I, I find manufacturers uh, that doesn't know of the opportunity that automation um, and industry 4.0 technology gives them and that can really improve productivity, quality and health and safety in their, in, in their works. Thank you very much, Mr. Stefan and Hans Fechner. Your answer to this question, please. Um, as you may know, we are supplying complete uh, lines for the production for the wood industry, wood-based panel industries. And so far, uh, we are building our plants far away from Germany. And one of the points of these new technologies that we see is that we are able to simulate well in advance with the new technologies we have today uh, parts of the plant. So we call it digital twin method. And uh, so we are benefiting, uh, we, we, we are just realizing the benefits that are coming out of these new technologies to be faster and to be more efficient during our commissioning phase so we can shorten up the time for our customers when they start to operate the plant. But what we need, and coming back to the, to the main question, are well-educated and well-interested young people. And so the emphasis for the future will be that uh, a new generation of engineers that is more uh, educated in a certain way, not only concentrating on uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, hydraulic engineering, but they have to learn something about systems engineering and the uh, information technologies. And these people are necessary for us. And uh, we see here a clear um, development in Germany that a lot of companies like ours is thinking in the same way so the demand for good engineers will increase. And that means for me that although we have a lot of modern tools, although we have this digitalization and industry 4.0, we need the human brain. And again, to say very good engineering capability and engineering people that we have to combine with our experienced elder generation to uh, move ahead. This is my opinion. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanf Hefner. And Alexander Wigand from CEO of Vika. People are the most valuable resource of any company. Um, <clears throat> I have difficulties to say that this might be the weakest link. I think this is the um, strongest link. Um, nevertheless, there are a huge um, amount of new te technologies around which are, um, <clears throat> offer big chances to improve productivity, to improve um, <clears throat> environmental protection, to improve energy saving, and <clears throat> everybody has, has to be open to adapt th those new technologies. But on the other hand, if there are so many technologies around, you also have always to ask yourself, what is the final purpose? There is no need to use a technology to use it. We are, I always ask myself, when I, when I, when I talk, think about a new technology, is it good for our customers? And will the customer pay for it? Is, will it improve our productivity? So is there a certain return on investment? Or is it good for our people, our employees? I think those are always the three main questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, dear Alexander, and dear Mr. Montorov. So you are regularly participating in these sessions. So we like to make these bridges to the to previous in the prom exhibitions, and 
let, let me first comment on what has just been said here. So are we talking about a specific company here, or are we talking about the ministry? I have noted that all the present people present here at this discussion, uh, they s use the human language when in this conversation, even though the topic is about software, technologies, robotics, but thankfully we're still using the human language talking to each other. Uh, we have not switched to the digital language, and it's nice that all the comment co commentators, they, are, they have this single position that the human role is still very great and is, a, in, is of key importance. And you, Anton, when you said that at the next Inoprom we will ask, we will ask a digital assistant, a robot, whether humans are needed still. Hopefully, we will not have to ask that question. That should be scary, because uh, the the AI may tell us, "You, we, I don't need you. There's no need for you." but we will not be able to get together and discuss our human topics. So I think it's not for us to ask this question whether we are needed, but we will be shaping the technologies, which will not be asking these stupid questions, but will work efficiently and to reach those objectives that we define as people. Thank you, uh, Denis Valentinovich. But I do agree that practically all, all of you said the technological processes, to an extent, uh, uh, the human factor is always there, and some replacement by robots uh, in those processes, they may help to optimize and improve the quality, but the producers and the, uh, that, that's for the producers, but the design and the development of the technological process, I think it, it will be done by humans, of course. Thank you for that. So robots will be playing a greater role, but humans will be still important. Let's uh, applaud, uh, not me, but let's applaud humans. Denis Valentinovich, you oftentimes speak on behalf of the government and the ministry, and now you spoke on behalf of the human beings. And my question is that many remembered your irony uh, at the last strategic session when some uh, leaders of large companies were responding slowly to the questions. And in fact, the topic uh, of this uh, slowness of bureaucracy in large companies is well known. There are many examples when large companies lose their market because they're not able to keep up with the changes like Microsoft. It missed the mobile revolution. Nokia missed the the appearance of smartphones, GE uh, made made great losses, been they were not able to reformat their business. So those large elephants, so to speak, large companies, they are slow to change. But small companies, they lack resources to implement those technologies or develop those technologies. So my question for you is this. So where is the golden mean? how companies may remain large and keep growing keep growing because growth is a natural process and if it's a successful company they need to grow but also they need to stay mobile they need to be sensitive to new technologies implement them so use this keyword this sense so having this sense you should so both large companies and those companies that just uh, come out to the market and still shape their strategy and begin to develop their business. But somehow mm, you, you were careful talking about one uh, company, but you uh, criticized Microsoft and Nokia. I think you have double standards there. So I don't want to comment on how and who 
missed out on something or they started catching up with the trends, but it was too late. But I can give you any, some Russian examples and international examples when we talk about the implementation and the use of modern technologies. And the I'm talking about transition to new format in new industries that in, in the past was, was not applicable. Like uh, we talk about General Electric back in 2011, it launched, I think it was in Brazil if I, if I remember well. I think, I think it was Brazil, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, they launched a software center, an engineering center to develop IT products. So GE traditionally was a, has been involved with and perceived as a hardware company. And here, all of a sudden, they open something new and they they entered this software sphere and it, on par with such well-known uh, companies in that area in that sector for example russian helicopters started to use on the contrary digitalization of their technological processes in such a way to, so that are able to optimize costs, as I heard today, one of the colleagues said, so you create a digital twin. Basically, it's, a, it's an imitation of a real production, but you do it digitally, so it gives you some hints, some ideas. On the other hand, you are able to implement the best technologies so you are able to reduce production costs by 20% and increase uh, performance and improve performance of the company. So on the one hand, uh, as I said last year, uh, you're quite right about this. And I could repeat that, that for the most part, large companies have a difficult time restructuring, changing, and it takes time for them to respond to those trends. But some of them have a good sense of what's going on. They have resources, and which uh, small companies may lack. And it all depends on the people. It brings us back to the people. Who heads that company? What kind of management is there? Who oversee production? If they, respond, if they re respond quickly, then the company responds a quick, quick, uh, in a quick manner to the processes that take place. So it all depends on, the, uh, on how quick decisions are made. So because of your position, uh, you, I know that you're not able to comment about specific companies, but what is your forecast for Tesla still? It's a small company, fairly small company, but it develops a cutting edge technologies. Do you think it will be ahead of all the other, uh, ahead of other car majors? Who will win in this competition? I think that Elon Musk would be offended if he heard us here that it's a small company. But uh, by our measures, it's a large company that is involved not only with production of electric cars, but also production of, and it launches uh, uh, space rockets. So we should not try to diminish. No, but Tesla, we were talking just about Tesla. It's a fairly small company. I wouldn't even compare them. We, sh we cannot compare them by the number of items, how many serial cars they have produced. We shouldn't compare th them how well they are oriented, how well they're aiming at this. So maybe we should compare them to other electric car producers. So if we are comparing them in that segment, then Tesla is, is the largest out of those who work in this market. But every country 
chooses its own way. And some countries, like you may have noticed that, uh, if you watch China, for example, China actively um, is involved with technical upgrade. It shuts down uh, production facilities which are present a hazard to the environment. They become they become greener. And so environmental concerns and environmentally friendly transport is important. I was in Shanghai, and the Minister of Transport of China was speaking there. And by 2025, 50% of the market of cars in China will be, it will be electric cars. I don't know if it will be 50%, but if the Chinese set such a goal for themselves, they will achieve that. And here, today, we effectively use gas fuel for vehicles. We have good, great deposits of hydrocarbons, including gas. And as you know, gas motor fuel is used for cars. It's the most environmentally clean fuel out of those used. But of course, that does not exclude the possibility of the use of hybrid cars or electric cars. Sooner or later, the volume of production and the market volume will increase for electric cars. But that will not happen overnight. The process will be evolutionary. But once again, every country follows its own objectives and goals where it's not our goal to make to have only electric cars in Moscow there is a program a decision was made to switch to electric public transport by 2025 I think for 100 percent or for 80 percent but electric uh, transport will be dominating. But Moscow can afford it. It has the budget for it. But other regions and cities may not have this opportunity. So these technologies are still expensive. So when you ask me how Tesla w will be performing, it all depends on how the shareholders of Tesla, how they will be how much patience they will be able to demonstrate and wait for the time when the volumes of consumption of those cars will be sufficient to increase that production. And one day it will happen, I guess. So you mentioned China and its pri priority, uh, including uh, electric cars, so before in a prom in Moscow, we ran an event with the, with the International Federation of Robotics, uh, where Minprom Torg asked uh, r robot producers to localize their production here. And they said, it's still a small market. So I have this question, and I have a small reference. This year, in the business world, um, Blue Ocean Strategy was a very po has been a very popular book. So the authors say that most companies um, they want to be successful in highly competitive markets, and they their costs are great, and and it's a difficult market. And Blue Ocean is open green field where there is no almost no competition. So the authors. Now, encourage producers to work in those blue oceans, not to crowd the small, those small, over, already overcrowded markets. So do we have those priority sectors in Russia where your ministry encourages producers to move to those areas, to develop those technologies and products, to r really produce something that nobody else produces? Actually, ask me two questions. So the first question is about these blue and red oceans. 
I think only extreme managers wouldn't wouldn't dream of swimming in this blue ocean without competition where you have new horizons new prospects it's all free you just develop new products and you feel comfortably but but it's difficult to develop a product any kind of product that would be competitive and also would shape this new environment new niche or a global market so sooner or later they will face uh, some components some elements of this red ocean and the second question was about how we are doing with with new products technologies that you as the ministry of industry and trade encourage and you see, because you see prospects for them of course we incentivize companies we encourage them to create new products new prototypes but first of all it depends uh, let's go back to this human factor it all depends on the managers if, if they're really motivated and interested in developing their uh, those new niches new p in new productions but we have a broad range of government support for companies and oftentimes companies use those opportunities they but you asked about something else you asked about how we motivate uh, implementation of, uh, of of robotics against the background of uh, of the fact that the market is fairly small and you're quite right we are in the level of localization in all industries including robotics should be the same as in car making industry and there are some comparable industries but uh, the automobile industry is the one that is the most that th is the one that has the most robots any industry that is aimed at uh, the consumer sector like uh, car making industry it's client oriented so it should be um, maximally robotized to be able to quickly increase production volumes and also to de to decrease decrease costs and so to diminish the human component uh, the, so it should be sensible done it should be done in a sensible format we should find a good compromise between the fact that on the one hand we are interested in up gaining uh, obtaining uh, those robots and which are produced outside of Russia and we import them from our, our international partners and we know all of them and at the same time we invite them here to develop new technologies jointly and then gradually we can uh, pr produce them jointly but it's a process thank you uh, Dennis Valentinovich. So let's uh, continue with this topic of robotics. We have some representatives of this sector, Hadim Tsuda and Mr. Hussein. So we mentioned uh, the head of Tesla, and he was uh, one of the skeptics. Uh, uh, he publicly wrote about his disappointment with robots. He says the robots are not adaptive, they're poorly, uh, poorly adja adjust to changing conditions, they make a lot of mistakes. And I know that uh, 
he is a client of a robotics company. So you as producers of robots, how do you take that criticism? Robots have been in production for 50 years and clients uh, become, for the first time, they're skeptical about the use of robots. So human needs, a producer's needs are pr advancing, and you as robot, robot producers, you're not, kept, ke you're not uh, keeping up with them. So Mr. Lampa, can you respond to that? Uh, obviously, talking about a specific company such as Tesla is always very sensitive since it's a, a very, very important customers of ours and, and, and Mr. Musk's uh, input is, is highly appreciated by us. But I can say on the general uh, term, um, when one plans for a product, in order for the robot uh, robot success rate to be really high, the product needs to be thought and designed for automation and robotized automation already from the beginning. So that's one part. And second part is um, when one is planning the factories, when one is training the people, when one is looking at the labor uh, situation, are we having access to labor, etc. All of those things are part in a chain that creates su success for manufacturing, especially for automated manufacturing. So it's the whole chain, and if you go too fast in some of these parts, um, uh, meaning that you maybe go a little bit too fast not thinking about how to design the product, if you deploy the robots in too high uh, numbers too fast without having the right training in place, and also when it comes to the integration capacity, do you have the technical skills there to integrate that mass of robots? All those things has to be thought out in order to become successful. And typically, uh, if you go too fast, you will you, there is a risk that you will have a, a, a setback, that you will, you will encounter a little bit of a, 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 a kickback, that you have to take a step back, rethink, and then go forward again. However, what I can say is that there is just no other way than to utilize robotics and automation, and especially if you produce products in a higher cost place. Uh, if you're producing cars in a higher cost labor place, the only way to be successful is robotics. So here I would say the core thing is to work very closely between the product designers, the robot companies, and the integration companies, the, the, the companies that actually puts these robots into production. That triangle needs to be very closely tied together and working towards that product design, and then it's successful. And we have so many positive examples. And I think uh, Mr. Musk is a very impatient person, which is very, very positive, because he wants to go fast. And that sometimes creates challenges for all parties in that equation. Thank you very much, Stefan. Mr. Tsude, your comment, please. I got, actually, I agree with uh, Stempe's opinion. Uh, there has been a, maybe 50 years of a relationship between robot manufacturers and uh, car manufacturers, actually. So they, customers understand how robot works, and more importantly, they, they know how to make cars. And then cars are so developed to be automated. And then processes are so made to be automated. And then together with those no, no, accumulated knowledge, we could use the robot most effective manner. But uh, so robot, we cannot say that the robot can do anything we want to do, but uh, need an experience. And, and a most important ex experience, I would say, is that the experience of not just a robot, but how to make the process work. So production engineering is one of the most important thing, and then process engineering is secondly, important thing, and third, thirdly important is robotics itself. And then the combination of those to make up systems, that will be very, very, very important. And naturally, we talked, I talk, just to talk about uh, car manufacturers, which we've been working with them for 40 to 50 years. But now, 
there are many people who want to use, start to use robotics. So all of us are uh, establishing service centers, training centers, training robots, and then in addition to that, we're trying to release, we're releasing the products which can be easier to use and easier to program, safe, more safer to use. But more importantly, again, the, the core is understanding of the manufacturing process. That is not our uh, knowledge, that's the customer's knowledge. So, but the combination of those will make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tsuda. Mr. Hussein from ABB. Thank you. Uh, I think um, for uh, robots, you know, as they are today, the modern uh, industrial robot, uh, which is basically microprocessor controlled, it's, uh, you know, uh, fully articulated, electrical robot, was introduced by ABB in 1974, and since then, it's been widely deployed. And, you know, economists have also estimated that the productivity gains that deployment of the, of the robots in industry is uh, comparable to what happened in the first industrial revolution in the first 50 years, productivity gains. So it's been extremely useful, but I think, um, what has made uh, robots to be very productive is things like it's the speed that it has, the precision that it has, it's the endurance that it has, and the strength that it has, okay? So, but it does suffer for some limitations, um, which is you have to tell the robot for it to be productive, you have to tell it precisely what needs to be done, you know? That is what system integrators and others do. Programming a robot is not a trivial task. This is, this is um, an element of uh, the robotics still uh, quite recently. I think it's all, they also not collaborative. In the sense, if you go to an industrial plant, you see cage, uh, ro uh, robots in cages. The cages are not to keep the, to keep the robots in, they are to keep the people out, not to hurt the people. So they are, they're, they're not collaborative. They need to be told precisely what, what, to be, uh, what is to be done. And they are not flexible. If something goes out of the ordinary, they are not capable of handling it. But this is precisely what the new uh, you know, um, trends that are going on in the fourth industrial revolution is addressing. The ease of use of robots, uh, you know, uh, how uh, robots have to be programmed, has to go from programming them to teaching them to finally a stage where robots can learn by themselves. And not just learn individually, but learn and share the learning. These are not science fiction things anymore. These are in early stages, but they are on the way, okay? So uh, uh, think of uh, a situation where robots will be able to, a robot that is sitting in Singapore, finds out a new way of doing something and is able to share it instantaneously to all other robots that are doing the same kind of task, being able to handle new situations. Uh, they need to be aware of what's around them. The human being comes near them, they uh, adapt rather than just stopping. Okay? They adapt to the presence of human beings, work together with human beings uh, that are there. So I think that is also very, very important that what is happening today is going to lead to, in a way, uh, democratization of robotics. Uh, I, I think it's been mentioned sev several times that it's automotive industries that are uh, uh, the biggest users of robots. Um, I would say they are the biggest users of robots, uh, not because there is no need for robotics elsewhere. It is because it takes a lot of effort. You need a lot of infrastructure to actually keep the robots, um, uh, to deploy robots. Once you deploy them, they are highly productive. So deployment makes, it becomes, uh, the bar for deployment goes down. They will be more widely adopted. Smaller companies will be able to use them. And that is what I mean when I say democratization, they will be accessible uh, to uh, many people. So yes, I think uh, today's robotics do have some limitations, just like anything else. And the good news is 
that the technologies that we are talking about today are the ones that will actually take them beyond that, those limitations, uh, and then more things will become possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Hussein and Alexander Vigan from Vika. The German scientists are theorizing on the industry for uh, industrial revolution 4.0. They talk about IoT, rob robotic technology, 3D printing, artificial intelligence. For a number of people, this is just, these are just buzzwords, buzzwords who, which migrate from presentation to presentation. How do companies actually use these technologies? Like your company, how do how 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 do these technologies interact with each other? Do you do you have any synergy effect? Do you have any benefits from using them in combination with each other? Question: If we have some benefit of combining those technologies. Um, in most of the cases, we, we start to use them. For example, when we talk about big data or artificial, artificial intelligence, we start now a project which should help us in the end to have better predictions of our future order income, which is always a problem for us that we have um, our order income is not very steady and we don't have any reliable um, predictions. This is something we are starting now. But from for, um, right now, from our perspective, the most interesting of these um, technologies is um, IoT or IIoT. It, we call it Industrial Internet of Things because um, as a sensor manufacturer we are, there is something really new today or something yeah, rev revolutionary that today for very low investment, for very um, low money, you can bring any sensor signal, wireless or wired, um, into the cloud, apply some algorithms and get some information which you can use um, to increase your productivity, to do predictive maintenance, to do maintenance on demand, um, to help you to, to save energy, etc., etc. So this is from, our, from the perspective of our company the most important. Um, those possibilities um, of um, this um, yeah, industrial internet of things. There's nothing which you could not have done 10 years um, ago, but today it's, um, everybody can afford it. And you have um, <clears throat> a lot of possibilities to increase your productivity by um, <clears throat> using those um, technologies. Thank you, Mr. Wigand and Mr. Hafner. In Zimpel, in Zimpelkam, do you see any synergy among these technologies, technologies which are, which form the basis of the fourth industrial revolution? Do you use some of these technologies? And oh. um, uh, absolutely. And um, what I mean is the combination of big data on the one hand and artificial intelligence on the other hand. On the other hand, uh, since some years we have developed a system, and at that time the buzzword uh, Industry 4.0 was not existing already. So we, we are very proud to be a little bit ahead of that. And uh, what we are doing is um, installing in our production line a system that we, call, that we call Production Intelligence or Prod IQ. And that system is collecting data and collecting or collecting when you start the planet operation is collecting the information and is permanently judging it and compares it with the product that the line is producing. And so the system goes first through a learning phase that may take some months even. And after that, uh, the system knows even better than the operators or different shifts that operating the plant what would be the right settings for controlling the whole system. So. These technologies are not, not new. They were already invented 30 or 40 years ago in the petrochemical industry for huge plants. The difference to today is very simple. Now you have processor capability that is huge in comparison to the big IBM systems 30 years or 40 years ago. 
It is absolutely cheap, the processor capability or the processors, the controllers, and you can handle much more data in, very, in, in a very short time. And your, your, your algorithms that you have to develop, that is quite clear, you have to develop these algorithms, and therefore you need the people. These algorithms can be, can be uh, cycled in very short time because of the capability of the processors itself. This is a huge uh, advantage, and um, I think that this will be the future that, um, especially concerning to our products, that the systems become more and more sophisticated and learning by themselves. We are not using robots in our factory, we are not using robots in our production lines, but I think that this is the most interesting benefit and again, I'm coming back to my point, you need well-educated people. They, they are developing the future. Uh, the machine can only learn if, they, if the system, the computers, know what they should do. It's like the genetic code you have also in your brain. You are, as a human being, you are able to learn. But somehow, uh, we got the capability to learn. Yeah, that is my point. Therefore, you need man, mankind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hafner. And so a question to you. So heads of companies like to tell stories about their success. However, implementation of new technologies, implementation of revolutionary technologies also always is done through trial and error method. And I think we, are, we will be most interested to listen about those cases when mistakes were made and what conclusions were made on the basis of these mistakes. So we, which mistakes were made by big companies? Can, may I ask you, uh, our esteemed colleagues and experts, who would like to share their experience in terms of failed implementations or some mistakes which were made over the course of implementing these new technologies? Which conclusions you made? And what lessons did you learn? Who would like to answer? Basmi, you'll be the first one, please. Uh, you know, ABB is, uh, we, um, is a pioneering technology leader. We have been uh, there for 130 years. We consistently invest in, um, in innovation and R&D. We spend $1.5 billion a year on uh, our research and development, and we have a very strong uh, research group as well. Um, we work a lot with universities um, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, with startups, with partners, so we have a very wide ecosystem for uh, um, our innovation system. Over the years, we've been pretty much pioneers. I mean, we I talked about industrial robot in 1974, I think very recently, some time back, we came out with the first human collaborative robot called Yumi, where, which is completely safe for, uh, for, to work with people. High voltage DC, which is uh, really today in a way when you're looking at uh, the world is moving towards more renewable sources, uh, which are far away. Uh, that is the technology of choice to uh, bring uh, that uh, closer to uh, where, where the needs uh, of energy is. So these are, that was introduced by ABB in 1954. So we've been there, we've been there quite early. But we have also had some things that did not uh, go right, and I'm going to give you one example. You know, when, when, uh, when you look at a lot of things that are happening in, um, uh, you know, in robotics and many other areas, one uh, or electric cars, uh, one key component is the power electronics part, and there, there you have, um, you know, wide band gap semiconductors that are that can work much better. They work, work with higher temperature, higher power, etc. ABB was one of the first researchers of that. We spent quite a lot of money, triple digits, uh, and um, uh, then uh, we came across a problem that was, uh, you know even today not solved, but now people have found some other ways around it, uh, and we stopped all our work uh, uh, on that. 
Okay, and that was about 15 years ago. Now, of course, it's coming back. Uh, silicon carbide is coming back in a big way. So timing in industrial research is very important. Stamina is very important. When we are, when we are looking at industrial research, and I think if you want to be a leader, you have to accept that you have to plan for the next 10 years or, or beyond and uh, invest in that, you know, and uh, if things don't work out, also know when to stop them. And Mr. Ferner, would you like to share with us your stories? One very important uh, point is how to implement new technology in a company, even if you have if you have a very traditional company, ours is now 135 years old, and then you have a lot of tradition, and uh, tradition and implementing new technology is permanently a fight between tradition and future. So you have people that are liking that, and they want changes, and others, they don't want it. And if you put in uh, a new ideas in the top-down method, it can happen to, to the leaders or to the, to, uh, to the CEO, that nothing happens at the end and that the success is not there and it takes two or three years and nothing happens at all. So it is a question of, of implementation and finding a qualify, qualified people and qualified teachers somehow that are implementing new technologies and you need uh, people that are keen to implement it into the company and into, into the strategy. Again, it's a human factor that is deciding if it is a success or not. And uh, for my opinion, it is very necessary that the leader of such a company, even if it is a small one or a big one, has to emphasize that I can uh, absolutely uh, support this, what my colleague said. You have to plan for perhaps five to ten years and then you have find the right people at the right time that are doing that. Thank you. Dear participants of the main strategic session, it is with great joy they invite to the stage with their speech Deputy Prime Minister of the Russian Federation, Dmitry Kazak. Dmitry Nikolaevich, welcome to Uniprom. Good afternoon. Dear friends, esteemed colleagues, on behalf of the government of the Russian Federation and on my own behalf, I would like to welcome you here, all the participants and guests of this main industrial show in Russia. Special uh, words of greetings to our international guests. Thank you for the interest that you demonstrate to towards our country, for believing in Russia, for, in, for believing in its great potential. I would like to express a special thanks to the Ministry of Industry and Trade, to the government of Sverdlovsk region, to the uh, city uh, authorities for the wonderful preparations for this show. And I can say that the management team of Inoprom and also city infrastructure have been successfully tested in order to host the main industrial show uh, in 2025, which will take place here. And here at, uh, at this exhibition, we traditionally have very lively discussions uh, which help business representatives and government authorities to learn more about um, 
today's technologies, how it can be applied and used. And for Russia, these topics are of principal importance because we need to have such changes in our economy that should make it possible for us to switch to a new model of development in a short time. Its foundation should be based on high-tech industries and using cutting-edge knowledge. We are talking about digital technologies here. At, at this session, when we talk about humans, machines, and software, it's a very top, uh, important topic. What, what ratio is needed when we blend these key factors of success in order to be a leader, in a, mar a market leader? Undoubtedly, production chains will be a, will include people, and people will be playing a very important role. And as new technologies spread, new professions will emerge for highly qualified people. Mar and the labor market will be transformed, production will be transformed by robots, and low qualified jobs are going out of the door. So people need to learn new professions, new jobs, and some things that robots still cannot do. Of course, today we have to learn every day, regardless of what we do. We need to regularly improve our qualifications. We need to update our competencies and knowledge, make sure it is still needed, and what will be needed tomorrow. Russia is rich with talents and with uh, forward-looking people, and this invaluable potential is still there. Our school students win oftentimes at international Olympic Games. They were successful at world skills. They were number one and uh, as in, in team competition. But young people should be interested about these future prospects and such competitive conditions should be offered for them so that they would want to live and work here in Russia. Of course, it depends on businesses and it depends on the state and innovations to be born and to be implemented in Russia. They need to have a, a specific ecosystem. We develop competency competency centers at our uh, universities where we selected 14 centers for S uh, prospective technologies that will have a lot of impact, such as AI, bioengineering, communications, etc. We understand that, of course, it's much broader than this, uh, and those objectives go far beyond professional activities of those people. Of course, we need to provide r uh, housing for them. We need to make education accessible to them. We, of course, environment should be safe and clean. Business should be uh, acting in the right and legal manner, etc., etc. That, that makes uh, everything attractive for our citizens and for inter international. That is what makes our economy attractive. And these objectives have been defined by our presidents. And these are national objectives for our country. So businesses, industries, in close cooperation with government officials are working together to achieve these goals. Speaking of the second aspect, the machines, things are not so well yet because our production facilities are uh, some of them are obsolete, some of them are worn out. The average age in oil processing is 19 years, in metallurgy is 17 years, and chemical production is 14 years. So for 10,000 uh, workers, we have only three industrial robots, even though the world average is 69. And in leading countries, uh, it's over 100. So understandably, we still need to do a lot of work and many things uh, needs to be done to transform the production sphere. So, and the government provides a set of tools to stimulate it, to incentivize companies. So different, they offer different production subsidies to produce competitive products for R&D, for design and engineering, of future technologies, and we have industrial development fund 
and we have projects to modernize um, components to digitalize our industries. Uh, last week, in the government, we completed activities to improve the institution of special investments contracts. So so-called SPIC two will be fully implemented and it should help develop new technologies in Russia. What is very important here is to ensure uh, openness and predictability of the government and, and the environment and special investments contracts are meant to provide that. So this mechanism uh, will be um, used by regional and municipal authorities to ensure stable, reliable conditions for businesses to implement those special investment contracts. So the third area, software. So the future of industry is about interaction of different systems, production facilities, augmented reality, 3D printing, cloud technologies, and government actively supports these developments. We launched um, technological initiatives, and we have a strategy of technological development. We have a Digital Russia program, and the government has created a special platform and, and non-commercial uh, organization called Digital Economy, which involves 16 leading companies in this area. And thousands of experts are involved in uh, multiple projects in such areas as um, human resource, technological development, legal regulation, IT infrastructure, and IT securities. The, all of them are of key importance for businesses we also launch in, in, in technological uh, approach so to change consumer properties of products and pilotless aviation and also adapting vehicles for harsh winter conditions. So we have two competitions and, and, and prize prizes offered are for almost for 400 million rubles so we will have a substantial conversation on this and these topics and other topics Inoprom has always helped align different approaches and de develop new ones and today we need to have breakthrough uh, initiatives high tech uh, techno high tech technologies that will take us to the future and Russia businesses already have them it is with great pleasure that I will present the national prize uh, Industria for achievements in innovation industries for ideas that change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dmitry Nikolaevich. Dmitry Nikolaevich has already announced for those who are here for the first time at Inoprom that annually we present the National Industry Award called the Industria. Back in the Soviet days, we have Stakhanov, heroes of labor, the best workers, the, the best performers. Uh, but we think that the heroes of today's Russian productions are teams that really change the world of industry and create high-tech pr products. And Russia enters international markets with those products. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you our uh, National Industry uh, pro Award called Industria. Let's watch the, the screen. Every year from November, we receive 
submissions, applications from Russian companies, we accumulate them and then they pass them on to the International Expert Council headed by the min by Denis Mantorov, uh, the Minister of Industry and Trade. And those experts out of those applications select five nominees, five nominees for the Industria uh, Award of 2018. Uh, Inatech, Met, Monocrystal, Rotec, Havel, and Umatex Group. From my perspective, all the five nominees are winners, and we are proud of our, Ru of our Russian companies who boldly enter international markets. They work for the most part in red oceans, but they are ahead of their competitors. So we see five uh, Russian companies here, but we have only one statue. And every year, only one winner gets it. And it is with pride that I announce the name of the winner of the National Industrial uh, Award, Industria 2018. It's Monocrystal. And Maxim Shershnov, um, Director for Economics and Finances, it's a government prize. So it is presented by the Deputy Prime Minister, Dmitry Kazak. Congratulations. Thank you very much for your support and recognition. Today's forum proves another time that Russia has many high-tech, unique companies that are worthy of respect and recognition at the highest government level. Our company was able to prove that Russian industrial production uh, companies can achieve uh, success in, in domestic market but also in, on international markets in China and elsewhere. I should also note the fact that our successes would have been impossible without government support. The government's attention to s aimed at supporting high-tech exports is so important. And it is really one of the tools for us to be to win in this competitive in this competition. Thank you very much for this support. Thank you very much for recognizing our achievements. Dear colleagues, thank you, Dmitry Nikolaevich. Dear colleagues, as I stated before, all the five companies who were nominated, they are all winners, and we want for all of you to learn about these companies. Let's watch it let's watch the screen let's present these companies these five nominees innovative technology of metal working so programming programming machining tool for processing composite materials metals and stone no an, uh, analogous uh, equipment is produced in CIS countries. S the goal is to automate production processes and in a, in a Tehmet uh, products exceed properties of their f international analogs. Monocrystal is the largest producer of synthetic simfire for high-tech purposes. It's every uh, third smartphone in the world or luxury Swiss watch has uh, its, its sapphire. They also use it for light-emitting diodes. So they were able to produce large crystals over 300 kilograms in weight. So, and there is a great demand for their products. They export synthetic sapphires to 25 countries around the world. 
Rotec, uh, shareholding company, develops uh, diagnostic equipment to find the defects that may cause um, accidents and incidents at an, on, on industrial and, uh, and transport systems. It uses energy. It, it's, it pre, it's, its products are used in machine building, in oil and gas industry, in power generation, etc. So, total capacity of uh, of power plants uh, already connected to their equipment at six, six, six gigawatts. Group of company. Havel is introducing heterostructure solar module, new generation of solar modules based on heterostructural transition effect, and this technology is part from the top three ranking technologies. That helps to make these solar panels more than 22% efficient. These solar units are in high demand among industrial companies, which help them to become more power efficient and reduce their energy costs. Implementation of these new technologies will help to build 40 electric modules with capacity over 50 megawatts or 160 megawatts after 2020. Umatex Group introduces high-tech carbon fiber and UMD fiber is very light, very, very durable and re can resist aggressive effects. This, uh, this, uh, this fiber is used in aviation industry, shipbuilding, car building industry, energy sector in construction, used in making sports products and FMCG goods. Carbon fiber is um, a highly competitive project, uh, product fully in line with the quality standards and has high export potential. We would like to congratulate all the nominees and the winner of this uh, award. Our strategic session is over and four more days of work are ahead. Let me wish you each and every success to all of you on behalf of all participants of this session. Thank you for your time and thank you for staying with us. Thank you.